Okay, let's fucking go. Let's try to talk about this. There is an investment I did very recently called Periodic Labs. I was an angel investor and it's going to sound insane. It, it, it was a $300 million first raise seed round. Is this hype? Well, well I'm going to tell you a story of AI for Science, what Periodic Labs is doing and why this matters and is so exciting. So there is a um, post by one of their um, institutional investors at Bain Capital Ventures. Uh, their name's Slater Stitch. And he wrote a blog post. You know, obviously every investor is usually like showing their investments. Very natural. He wrote a blog post that was, it almost gave me chills in terms of how galvanizing it is of like this is the why now moment that we can make progress in the world of atoms and it really gives you a lot of understanding empathy the chills for why these stellar stellar researchers engineers scientists have joined periodic labs this large founding team um, led by liam fetus and doge um, Liam was one of the creators of ChatGPT. He led the post-training team at OpenAI before he uh, uh, co-founded Periodic Labs. I've actually known Liam for close to a decade now. He has, you know, turned down many founding roles at companies that you've all heard of um, in the large language model space. And uh, finally, he broke uh, out to do this. Um, I wanted to go over Slater's blog post, and I really encourage you, I'll leave a link in the description, really encourage you to read it yourself. It gives you this powerful sense of the why now. You know, it derives the necessary conditions for why we need autonomous labs, why you need this deep learning expertise to make progress in material science. You know, we have we have the success of models like ChatGPT because there are enough tokens, trillions of tokens on the internet that we learn from, that we generated as users over the last, you know, decades. And large language models are trained on those tokens. That's why they are able to, you know, seemingly talk to us, generate answers for us, maybe even write poetry. They're intelligent like they are. I think Andre Carpathy put it as, you know, spirits in the sense of it gets at the distribution of how we think. Um, but we lack the data in the physical sciences, and therefore we must build the machinery, the actual physical machinery for, for lab automation in order to generate the tokens that are needed for deep learning methods that are already proven to be successful in knowledge work on the internet, work the work for which tokens on the internet kind of exist, uh, you know, for training. We need to generate those tokens in the physical realm to make progress there. But then once we do, the repercussions are extraordinary. Like we can make room temperature semiconductors, new materials for chips, and anything that can be reliably, that depend on accelerating the data, scaling up the data is required for generating materials. So I do want to go through Slater's um, thing because it is just so well written. All right. So this is the blog article. So we must know, we will know. Yeah. Periodic AI designed to accelerate scientific discovery. So cut through all that. Let's get to the good stuff. See this picture. Galileo's drawings of Jupiter stars from Sidorus Nuncius. Nuncius. So, Galileo's drawings. Jupiter's moons. Ganymede, Callisto, Io, and Europa are too small to see from Earth with the naked eye. We know this. Nobody was going to discover them before the invention of the telescope. But once the telescope was invented, new astronomical discoveries came very quickly. There's always a prehistory to these things, but the first telescope patent we know about comes from the Netherlands. A spectacle, a spectacle maker, Hans Lippen, Lipperhey. Okay, so, you know, you can read that. I think what's really interesting is that it came very quickly. Once the technology was made, in this case, to grind up glass, good enough to be telescopes, and this was happening, like, it was just, wasn't just Galileo, there's another man, Simon Marius, literally independently discovered the moons one day after Galileo, and it's because the technology was ripe for discovery. The history of science is 
full of similar experience, examples in which technological progress enables the invention of a new scientific instrument, which in turn leads to new scientific discovery. If you want a cyclotron for particle physics experiments, you need powerful electromagnets. If you want a radio telescope that can detect CMB, you need cryogenic masers. So Galileo has newly invented, had the newly invented telescopes. We have newly invented AI systems, newly developed AI systems. The question becomes, what can we do now that we cannot do before? So before answering that question, let's take a little bit more of a foray in the history of science. Everything is computer. To think about the future of computational methods in science, it's useful to examine the past. The famous Richard Hamming said, for example, I came up with the observation at the time that nine tenths of experiments were done in the lab and one in 10 on the computer. I made a remark to the vice presidents one time that it would be reversed, that is nine tenths experiments would be done on the computer and one in the lab. They knew I was a crazy mathematician and had no sense of reality. I knew they were wrong and they've been proven wrong while I have been proven right. They built laboratories where they don't need them. I saw that computers are transforming science because I spent a lot of time asking what will be the impact of computers on science? How can I change it? I asked myself, how is it going to change Bell Labs? So when Hamming wrote this as he goes on to explain he was mainly talking about simulations, and that is true. Simulations made a huge difference, in particular when you're talking about the calculations that were required to make the atomic bomb. There's also a really interesting quote here. The immediate post-war metropolis Frankel calculation was very schematic compared to what I had in mind. More ambitious calculations of this sort had become possible since computers had improved both in speed and the size of their memories. The steps outlined involved a fantastic number of arithmetical operations. Johnny von Neumann said to me one day, this computation requires some multiplications, more multiplications than have ever been done before in all of humanity. And when I roughly estimated the number of multiplications performed all the world's school children in the last 50 years, I found that this number was larger by a factor of 10. Again, those were the times, right? Uh, now that we th barely think about it. The calculations required in a video game, just rendering, um, ray tracing. It's on commodity consumer hardware. We were able to consume and compute in order to get to the hydrogen bomb. And so again, encourage you to read through the details, but then it gets us to our next question, next natural question. What can we do now? given we have the developments in AI that we cannot before. The natural question asks is, what obvious bottlenecks that were there before have now been removed by the current advancements in AI? Next section, waiting for superconductors. So periodics focus, things that they wanna focus on is room temperature superconductors. And what's really interesting, and this article goes into far more detail, is that um, there's actually clear trajectory of the discovery of superconductors, um, temperatures rising, and it's very predictable. But if you review this history, uh, he notes a few bottlenecks stand out. The first is simply lab throughput. So that is these discoveries, only the successful experiments are published, and so you don't publish the many, many experiments that were run in order to arrive at these success stories. Um, and so an estimate would be that every synthesis that we know about, there are probably 10x or 100x more failed attempts. Of course, there's not so many grad students, so you can't just do grad or graduate student descent on this uh, problem, uh, but you can probably generate this data. So he elegantly puts it that the compression, <laughs> the data loss from experiment to journal is aggressive. And so to take this compression as given, we therefore must generate a lot more experimental data. But experiments run are run by flesh and bones right now, by people. But do they need to be? The experiments that we care about for superconductors are actually quite simple in 
um, how the, the gestures, the mechanics that generate them. And so that is the opportunity. That's also the conclusion. And I think you put it really beautifully. If you were organizing this as a new lab, so I mean, putting all these points together, you get a real picture of what you need in the why now moment in order to speed up the discovery of YBCO and other crystalline solids. You'd want a high throughput solid state synthesis lab. And this is exactly, I mean, so exciting what um, Periodic has built up and justifying why you need $300 million. So it's not hype, it is real. So you need to build out this lab, robotic arms, adding materials together, heating it up, adding materials together, together, heating it up and taking all the measurements that's needed to collect this data. Now you're generating the tokens that are needed. And then you apply deep learning methods to it. You take the best talent that created these deep learning successes, these models, and you also put them together with the the actual scientists, bring together the engineers, the machine learning and researchers, and together you cook up, up periodic labs. So I, I just want to read this. Now. So you would want high throughput solid state synthesis lab where you can run 100x or 1000x the number of experiments that a normal lab could. You want to collect detailed data from every experiment in an LLM friendly format. And you'd want a system for scanning journal articles and advancing ideas for promising experiments. It's not just about generating data, but you need to synthesize the wealth of academic data that's already out there because the academics right now are just kind of formulating the connections themselves through their reading and their comprehension. But that's something that modern LLMs are actually really good at, like holding these things in context, making these connections under the guidance of, you know, humans as well. And so together, um, and then finally you want the algorithms that could predict physical properties without requiring direct simulation, because that's hard. Direct simulation of those types of physical um, processes, that's what we don't have. So you want uh, algorithms that can predict them. And so if you're organizing this as a new lab, you want a team with deep expertise in AI and in solid state chemistry, Aspirationally, you want to recruit S-tier people. He wrote, recruit people who played major roles in the current deep learning wave and who have profound understanding of how the underlying systems work. Maybe the people who invented the attention mechanism or who are part of the original ChatGPT research team, for example, which they are. And you'd also want the leads of the most successful AI for science projects and the people who had built high throughput labs in the past. You want a deep integration between algorithms and physical experiment. All of this would be expensive, so you also want to raise hundreds of millions of dollars for GPUs, for top talent, and for the lab itself. Oh, and you call that company Periodic Labs. This is why I invested. This is why I am extraordinarily excited for AI for Science. We are finally achieving results in the realm of atoms. We're no longer locked into just the tokens we've generated on the internet. That's all successful and great too. There's a lot of interesting work to be done, but making moves in physical reality, that is a dream of AI for science. Finally, we have startups and the funders who are embarking on this. I'm you know, lucky and honored to be an angel uh, to participate. I'm just so excited about this. I wanted to share it with all of you and yeah, please take a look at the article, read it for yourself, and check out Periodic Labs. I think they already got like a ton of job applications because it was a very successful launch. And honestly, really interesting because they launched it literally on the same day as Sora. And they got the same order of magnitude likes on, on, on Twitter. And obviously likes, all this engagement could be considered frivolous. But I think it's a really good indication that this is inspiring. AI for science is inspiring. We are doing things in the real world. That's the promise of what general intelligence should give us. It should aid us to do more, to innovate, to achieve more. Yeah, wanted to leave you with that and uh, I'll see you next time.